And then later we'll look at our um, social and political self-determination. And as we hire these experts, let's remember the credibility spectrum we developed in the video risk management and focus on sources from here, whoops, from here up. Sometimes down here, think tanks and individuals can be useful for giving insight or new ideas, but they are less useful for analysis because of the greater potential for bias. Generally, that's what I mean when I say credible is about here up. I covered a lot of this in detail already in the video risk management, but it's worth a brief recap here. After a conscientious search for credible economic disaster scenarios arising from taking action when it wasn't necessary, the worst case scenario I could find from a credible source was a 3% reduction in GDP growth. That's the outside figure from a DOE report that Professor Ross McKittrick sent me. Most credible predictions, most predictions from credible sources put the worst case somewhere between 1.5 and 2%. Also note that that's GDP growth, which in the US over the past 30 years has averaged a bit over 3% per year and has actually been negative several times. So the worst case credible scenario is that the GDP continues to grow, but very slightly. I did have a chuckle when I came across a dire prediction from a 1998 Heritage Foundation article warning that if the US followed the Kyoto Protocol, by 2010 gasoline could cost as much as $1.91 a gallon. So what might a business leader make of this? That's it, he might say? That doesn't sound catastrophic. What else is out there about the economic effects of taking action? Oh, and fire that heritage guy. He's lost his credibility, and I don't have time for histrionics. Well, there is Bjorn Lomborg's Copenhagen consensus, which had full four Nobel laureates on board. They concluded that action on global climate change shouldn't be a priority compared to other world issues. But they didn't really talk so much about the negative economic impacts of action on climate change. And anyway, whatever credence we give to their advice is pretty much canceled out by the conclusions of the Economist Statement on Climate Change, a petition with six Nobel laureates, but who's counting, which concluded that the right course of action would actually make money. Plus, both of those were sort of think tanks anyway, so we're not going to listen too much to them. They're right in here, in the middle, so it's worth putting in the hopper, but um, it doesn't carry too much weight in uh, weighing opinions. There's also the Stern Report, prepared by Nicholas Stern for the British government. As we think about how much credibility to assign to him and his conclusions, now technically he's an, a, a professional individual down here, but he headed up a whole working group, and the gov so that puts him more in the think tank range, and the government of the world's 12th wealth wealthiest country listens to him. So I'd place his report somewhere in the high middle, higher than the Copenhagen consensus for sure, because a lot more work went into the Stern report, and a lot more was riding on it. So its methods were probably, under, uh, were probably way more rigorous because they were under greater scrutiny. His study concluded that this up here would cost about 1% of GDP. Note that we're talking GDP, not GDP growth. So don't try to compare it to the GDP number I just mentioned earlier. 1% doesn't sound like much, but in dollars, or pound sterling in their case, that is a huge amount of money. That sounds significant, our business leader might say, but then we'd be obliged to point out that the Stern Report estimated that although this would cost about 1% of GDP, this down here would probably cost about 20%. Holy cats, our boss explain, exclaims, is this guy for real? Well, I had the good fortune of having a brief email exchange with Professor Richard Tall, who's a critic of the Stern Report, and who has publicly said that the report is too pessimistic and, quote, could be dismissed as alarmist and incompetent, end quote. When I sent Professor Toll my standard request for credible worst-case economic scenarios, he pointed me to the Stanford Energy Modeling Forum, EMF, calling it, quote, the most authoritative source on these matters, end quote. After digging around for a while in their reports, I couldn't find any doomsday scenarios, but I did find this conclusion in a 1993 report. Thus, it is possible to reduce emissions significantly from their non-controlled level without significantly reducing the growth of the economy. This was exactly the opposite of what I was looking for. So I emailed the quote to Professor Toll, telling him that and asking him, if Stanford's EMF is the most authoritative source on these matters, am I left with no defense to the alarmist argument no one knows for certain, so why not act, just in case? Help! He never answered. I'm sure he's a very busy guy, but still, I'd like to know his response. Hmm, says our boss. Are there any other sources towards the top of that their credibility spectrum, you know, the really solid stuff, who have weighed in on the economic threat of action on climate change? Well, one of our topmost categories is statements from organizations that contradict their normal bias. Remember the U.S. Climate Action Partnership, that group of heavyweight companies like Ford, GM, GE, DuPont, Shell, BP, and others that I mentioned in previous videos? 
Their statement about the economics of action on climate change is pretty unequivocal. Each year we delay action to control emissions increases the risk of unavoidable consequences that could necessitate even steeper reduction in the future at potentially greater economic cost. Action sooner rather than later preserves valuable response options and should lower the costs of mitigation and adaptation. Remember, this is coming from groups whose acknowledged bottom line is to build value for shareholders. If you want to argue with them, you better have some pretty good stuff. And as long as we're at the top of the credibility spectrum, it's worth mentioning that the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS, said, The longer we wait to tackle climate change, the harder and more expensive the task will be. And the National Academy of Sciences said, Delayed action will increase the risk of adverse environmental effects and will likely incur a greater cost. True, those are organizations of scientists, not economists, but as long as you think that you and I are qualified to do armchair evaluations of the threat to the economy, why not let a few tens of thousands of PhDs have their say too? Criminy, exclaims our business leader leaning forward on the conference table. Why the heck are we still talking about this? It seems pretty clear what's in our best economic in interests. Any other arguments to be made? Well, there's the argument that if planned, debated spending would cause economic hardship up here, then last-minute panic spending compounded by natural disasters would almost certainly be even worse down here. And if the idea is to protect the economy, a phrase I actually lifted from the talking points of a Cato Institute presentation on AGW, then really, how good for the economy are floods, droughts, landslides, hurricanes, wildfires, epidemics, wars, and refugees? And even if we take the outlandish extremes, at least in a depression up here, you can still plant a subsistence garden. Down here in a chaotic climate, your area may not even have topsoil or a growing season. But then a voice of dissent rises from the opposite side of the conference table. I'd rather not take action on an uncertain threat so that we can face any real threat to do materialize down the road with the wealth that an unfettered economy would bring us. Hmm, says our boss. On the face of it, that sounds appealing.